Hello. Right. We're going to be live? All right, all right. Welcome, welcome everyone for um, the second iteration of our health series. Um, tomorrow is you today. I'll feature none other than Dr. Nadine Plummer, ND, and she will be blessing us with, once again, another wonderful presentation. Now, I'm not going to give away what the, uh, the title is today, but it is something that is affecting a great deal of individuals in our society, by extension, impacting those who are affected by it. And so in a very special way, I just want to welcome you for coming out and um, participating in this, and at the same time, inviting you to begin with a word of prayer. Then after which, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Plummer to come up and share um, once again, uh, mess, a message pertaining to our mental and spiritual health. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power, your presence, your perseverance with us, O oh Father, and that while we were yet sinners, you died on our behalf. We want to thank you, Lord, for once again blessing us with another Sabbath day and all its uh, blessings, O oh Father, time earmarked for us to uh, worship and adore you, Lord, and to rest from our labors. We ask in a very special way that you bless Dr. Plummer as she positions herself, O oh Father, to share a word with your people. Thank you for all that you do, Heavenly Father. And we now, once again, wait with much anticipation for your holy word to be shared. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Levy. Okay, so tonight we are going to be talking about da, 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 Alzheimer's and dementia. Alzheimer's and dementia. A topic which affects many and something that people are curious about. There's actually been a lot of recent uh, research on Alzheimer's and a few new things are coming out, new studies on Alzheimer's. So I hope that this presentation is informative and also is effective, uh, just in helping us not only to understand Alzheimer's, but also to understand uh, a few things that you can do even now to help present Alzheimer's and dementia. So things that can affect cognitive ability. Uh, 85 plus is a little more common with Alzheimer's. Sometimes for people who are 50 years old and more, they commonly have some kind of dementia. There are some hereditary factors. First degree relatives who have either Alzheimer's or dementia, the risk is higher. An increased risk, we need more research as to why the risk is increased, but that's what the studies show. Gender. Women formerly thought to have higher risk due to longer life expectancy and less education, but now it's actually equaling out. And then education. What they find is with a lower education uh, level, then there's a higher risk that could possibly have to do with lifestyle and lifestyle changes. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So... Uh, Things that can affect cognitive ability. Lifestyle, maybe uh, heart disease, one of the things, heart disease due to rheumatic fever equals an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, boxers, people with repeated head injuries um, are at greater risk. Uh, women who have been taking hormone replacement therapy for women over the age of 65 um, have an increased risk of dementia as well. And so this is uh, postmenopausal, uh, and often hormone replacement therapy is something that is, um, that is commonly used. Other risk for Alzheimer's disease, high blood pressure, and especially if you have had high blood pressure for a while, so chronic high blood pressure over time. Type 2 diabetes. Alzheimer's is called, uh, actually commonly called type 3 diabetes. Alcohol use, smoking, poor diet, 
and sedentary lifestyle are all things which can put you at a higher risk for Alzheimer's. So I want to talk a little bit about dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, the causes of this disease. Older age does not actually cause Alzheimer's because I'm sure some of us know people who are maybe in their 90s and 95, etc., cetera, and, um, and they, they don't have any kind of a memory issue or dementia. But older age is the most important known risk factor for the disease. The number of people with Alzheimer's disease doubles about every five years beyond the age of 65. About one third of all people age 85 and older may have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, scientists are learning how age-related changes in the brain may harm neurons and affect other types of brain cells to contribute to Alzheimer's damage. These age-related changes include atrophy. Atrophy is like a shrinking. Uh, atrophy of certain parts of the brain, inflammation, vascular damage, production of unstable molecules called free radicals, and breakdown of energy production within cells. That's from the National Institute on Aging. Um, there is a difference between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So when people say dementia, there are different types of dementia. Vascular dementia is due to ischemia. Ischemia is actually a lack of blood flow. So vascular dementia is due to a lack of blood flow to the brain. Usually this is due to something called atherosclerosis uh, or heart disease. Atherosclerosis means that the blood vessels themselves have probably like a lining of plaque um, and this lining of plaque means that there is poor blood flow going through the blood vessel. And in this way, there's less blood flow going to the brain. Normally, if there's atherosclerosis that's causing vascular dementia, there's also a risk of heart disease because if there's a lining of plaque in the arteries going to the brain, there's a lining of plaque in the arteries throughout the body. Uh, similar risk factors for vascular dementia, they're similar to those for a stroke or for a heart attack. Alzheimer's disease is actually a type of dementia. It was named after a German, German psychiatrist, you see him there, his name is Eloise Alzheimer's. And he discovered, when doing an autopsy on dementia, on a dementia patient, he discovered these proteins in the brain that seemed to be misfiled or they were abnormal or irregular, called uh, amyloid beta plaque or beta amyloid plaque. And he also saw these peculiar tangles, which are now called neurofibrillary neurofibr tangles. Uh, and together with this plaque and these tangles, they cause the breakdown of the brain structure. So Alzheimer's disease was named after a man whose last name was Alzheimer's. They found that this plaque, this amyloid beta plaque, uh, blocks signaling and blocks communication between the cells and it triggers a reaction, like an immune reaction, which causes the disruption of nerve cells or a disruption of disabled nerve cells. These tangles that I had referred to are built from the Dow protein which has collapsed into twisted strands in the brain, which obstruct nutrients from then reaching the nerve cells, and this leads to a death of brain cells. The plaque and the tangles start in the hippocampus. The interesting thing about Alzheimer's disease, uh, if any of you uh, know someone who has Alzheimer's disease, it is a progressive disease, and you'll notice different things happening over time and it's because different areas in the brain are being affected over time. So the first place where you might notice changes is in memory. Why? Because the plaque and the tangle start in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the brain's memory center. That's the area where new memories are formed, and hence that person may have difficulty, definitely would have difficulty making new short-term memories so it presents as short-term memory loss because that area in the brain, the hippocampus, where the new memories are normally formed, that area is the first affected. So that's one of the first things that you might notice. 
What happens next? Well, the proteins then invade other parts of the brain, at the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. The interesting thing about this area in the brain, so first you might notice there's an issue with memory. But the prefrontal cortex right here at the front of the brain, this is kind of the area of the brain that houses our personality. It's also the area in the brain where we do logical processing. It's the area in the brain that's kind of in charge of rational thought and rational decision making. So when that area in the brain is affected, then you might notice that this process of logical thinking is a bit different. There might be personality changes, which makes sense because that means that this area here is now being affected, the prefrontal cortex. The proteins affect the ability to process logical thoughts the way that that person used to process logical thoughts. After that, the emotion center in the brain is then effective, so affected. So it's like a step-by-step -step disease, and you notice the presentation based on the area in the brain that's being affected. The emotion center in the brain is called the amygdala. And this is the area in the brain. It's part of the limbic system in the brain, so it's the area in the brain that's in charge of our emotions and our emotional reactions. So it may seem okay. that you're noticing now that, oops, sorry, Siri is talking to me. So when that area in the brain you might notice that that area in the brain is then affected and that person's behavior is erratic. I found this on the web. Okay, the symptoms are both similar for vascular dementia versus Alzheimer's. Uh, but so it might be hard to tell the difference. So I wanted to kind of explain the difference between Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. As I said, Alzheimer's is just a type of dementia. So dementia is a general term for symptoms like, you might notice symptoms like a decline in memory, symptoms like a change in reasoning, symptoms like a change in thinking skills. But Alzheimer's itself, as I said, a type of dementia is a a specific brain disease. It is very common, so it's a specific brain disease that accounts for about 60 to 80% of dementia cases, but keep in mind it's a type of dementia. So if you're saying dementia, there it just is not necessarily Alzheimer's. It's interesting because new studies have been coming out over the course of the last year, especially a study at the University of Cincinnati where they're beginning to understand Alzheimer's in a different way. These new studies showing that it's a lack of a specific peptide called the beta amyloid or amyloid beta peptide, maybe a lack of that peptide that actually contributes to this plaque building up in the brain. So this was a, a study that was done last um, summer, June 2021 at the University of C Cincinnati. They found that that peptide is needed to keep the brain healthy, but sometimes it hardens into plaque due to specific circumstances, which we're gonna talk about. And so with this research, they're saying maybe it's actually a lack of the peptide that causes Alzheimer's disease. It's not actually the plaque itself that causes Alzheimer's disease. Because what they found is that many people actually have the plaque in their brains, but they don't present with Alzheimer's, and they don't present with the type of memory loss and the changes in rational thought and changes in personality. So they're starting to question, is it the plaque or what is it? And now they're thinking more that, you know what, I think it's, uh, they think that it's this peptide, the lack of the peptide that is causing uh, the presentation and the symptoms that we see. The research is focused on a protein called amyloid beta protein. That protein normally carries out its functions in the brain in a form that is soluble, meaning dissolvable in water. But it sometimes hardens into clumps, which then are known as amyloid plaques. So the question is, what causes it to harden? The conventional wisdom in the field of Alzheimer's research, and this is actually from a description of the study that I'd mentioned at the University of Cincinnati. The conventional wisdom in the field of Alzheimer's research for more than 100 years, so right until about 2021 or so, 
they thought that Alzheimer's was caused by this buildup of the plaque that I had mentioned, a buildup of amyloid plaque in the brain. But EPSI, he and his colleagues, they are the ones who are conducting, who conducted this study at the University of Cincinnati in uh, 2001. They are now hypothesizing that plaques are simply a consequence of something else. As a consequence of the level of soluble amyloid beta in the brain, a, a consequence of that level decreasing. So maybe not having enough of that peptide is actually the real cause of Alzheimer's. This is an ongoing study, but these new ideas are now being introduced. New ideas as to what actually causes Alzheimer's. Uh, this protein that I mentioned, the normal protein transforms into abnormal amyloid plaque when? Under situations of biological stress, under situations of metabolic stress, and under situations of infectious stress. Biological stress, metabolic stress, infectious stress, then can cause possibly that peptide level to go low, and when it goes low, then that causes this plaque, the beta amyloid plaque, to form. The paradox is that so many of us accrue plaque in our brains as we age, and yet so few of us with plaques then go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. This was said by Epsi, as I said, he's the professor of neurology in the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and that is the faculty that has conducted the most recent study, which is now questioning the 100-year-old uh, belief about what causes Alzheimer's. So there's something else that's happening. The amyloid beta precursor protein is a complicated protein with many functions. It's found on the surface of cells throughout the body. It is a large membrane protein that normally plays an essential role in neural growth, meaning in the growth of brain cells and repair. However, later in life, a corrupted form can destroy nerve cells, leading to the loss of thought and memory in Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of research that's happening right now, as you can hear a lot of research about Alzheimer's disease, a lot of um, questioning happening as to what causes Alzheimer's disease. And as this research continues, there's a lot of research into different cures now for Alzheimer's disease and also different tests for Alzheimer's disease. So there are advancements that are happening now, at least within the last year or two, that are very fresh and very new. Um, the cause of Alzheimer's probably includes a combination of age-related changes in the brain, along with genetic factors, environmental factors, lifestyle factors. We're going to talk about some of those. And as I said, also these stresses, the metabolic stress, uh, the infections or infectious stress as well, which is what they're now looking at. So I want us to look at the difference between Alzheimer's disease uh, as an early onset and Alzheimer's disease as it normally presents a little later in life. Because there are two kind of starting points to Alzheimer's, there are two types of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's, not as common, and then late, Alzheimer's, late onset Alzheimer's, a little more common. So with early onset Alzheimer's, those signs of Alzheimer's first appear between a person's 30s and mid 60s. So usually it's not suspected that that person would have Alzheimer's disease when they're only, say, 35 years old. But that's the case. It could be 35 or 40 for early onset. It's very rare. And it's usually caused by a gene and gene changes that are passed down from parent to child. And then late onset, late, late onset Alzheimer's. The signs first appear in a person's mid-60s. It's the most common type. And it may in involve a gene, which is now what they're looking at, called the, a a the ApoE4 uh, gene. Let's look at some signs. Signs of dementia, signs of Alzheimer's disease. So I want to look at the signs of age-related decline versus Alzheimer's. So that when these things are presenting, maybe in yourself or in a loved one, 
then you'd know what's going on. Okay, there are a few key differences and some things that look the same. With age-related decline, people tend to forget. But then they remember afterwards. Or uh, if they're told something, they'll remember and they won't ask it again. But then with Alzheimer's disease, that person will ask the same question again and again. And they haven't processed that last answer, plus they don't remember. So then they ask the same question as though they're asking for the first time. That's the type of memory loss that disrupts life. Forget, for example, that person might forget appointments and that type of thing. Uh, challenges in planning or solving problems. If it's due to age, uh, they may make math mistakes, for example, calculating bill pay payments. But if it's Alzheimer's disease, uh, they have difficulty concentrating. And doing anything takes a lot longer. Um, they may have difficulty completing familiar tasks, for example, driving. They may forget the rules to a game. And then with Alzheimer's disease, uh, they forget locations that would at one point have been very familiar. Um, to have a type of confusion, which is a confusion about where that person is at that moment, uh, what, what time it is in history or even what time it is during the day or where they physically are, that's not very common with age-related cognitive decline. But it's a little more common with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, often there's trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. That person might have problems with driving, can't, uh, can't actually judge the contrast, can't judge the colors. Um, you might notice that new problems are coming up. Problems with words. This is very common, meaning problems with speaking, problems with writing, uh, not able to find the words, not able to remember how to write the words. Uh, misplacing things is common with age-related decline. But usually, after you misplace the things, and this even happens to younger people as well, then you retrace the steps. And you can remember, oh yeah, if I think I did this and this and this. And in your brain, you can mentally go through that process and then identify where that thing is. However, with Alzheimer's disease, they're unable to retrace the steps. Um, decreased or poor judgment, with Alzheimer's disease, it's common for that person to feel left out, to feel withdrawn from society. And as I said, uh, with Alzheimer's disease, because the disease is affecting these different areas in the brain, when it begins to affect the prefrontal cortex, then you'll notice changes in that person's personality or changes in their mood, kind of erratic behavior, uh, because that area in the brain is being affected. Uh, with age-related decline, uh, maybe they may forget things occasionally. Um, they might misplace items sometimes. Um, but uh, they don't usually uh, forget and un are unable to then remember where that thing is or realize that they have forgotten. With Alzheimer's disease, they forget that a memory lapse has occurred. Um, the most common thing is difficulty remembering recent events. And as I mentioned, this happens because the first area that is affected in the brain is the hippocampus. And that's the area where new memories are formed. So it's very common for that person to forget something that has recently happened. Uh, this difficulty then progresses into confusion and then irritability when the prefrontal cortex is being affected, aggression also when that area in the brain that kind of houses the personality is being affected, mood swings, and then trouble with language. Eventually, it's not only the short-term memory which is affected, but eventually long-term memory loss occurs as well. And that's what happens with Alzheimer's disease. It's interesting because now they are looking into new tests for Alzheimer's disease. And what they're finding is with certain biomarker markers, these biomarkers or these tests, ty specific types of tests can detect the presence of plaque 
and the presence of tangles, uh, such as specific types of PET scans or measuring the amyloid endowed proteins in the plasma and cerebral spinal fluid, new types of tests to see if Alzheimer's disease is present but perhaps not presenting yet, uh, new blood tests, there's new testing coming out, trial studies are being done already now this year uh, in 2022. The mental status evaluation is an easy test that anyone can do. Um, it is just uh, asking a few simple questions. You know, what day is it? Uh, what time of year is it? Where are you? And then asking that person to draw a few things, like I'd like you to draw a clock. Okay, can you now draw like a, an analog clock? And now put this time on the clock, 5.30 or something like that. And the interesting thing is uh, with Alzheimer's disease uh, that it's difficult to actually grasp where the small hand goes and where the long hand goes and what each of those signifies. So sometimes that can indicate uh, that, that that type of progression is happening. Uh, brain scans are tests that can also be done as well. But the easiest one there is the mental status exam or evaluation which can be done at home. Other tests. There's been a test that's been developed by Bateman and colleagues, a blood test. And as I said, as I mentioned, this is a new type of blood test which will assess whether that plaque that I'd mentioned has begun accumulating in the brain based on the ratio and the levels of the amyloid beta proteins, these specific types of proteins, amyloid beta 42, amyloid beta 40, they're looking to see if those proteins are in the blood already. And with that type of testing, it would be like an early detection type of test. Complications of Alzheimer's disease can include urinary incontinence, infections such as pneumonia, falling, and mental illness. But we are going to get to some of the good news. So before getting to things that can make a difference or things that you can do for prevention, I want us to be able to understand a little more about the disease. So you might ask, is lifestyle a contributing factor? And I would say that yes. Some basic things in lifestyle can make a difference. So we're gonna think of these basic things in lifestyle as the three S's. The three S's that can make a difference. Um, if you remember, I said that there were three different types of stresses that they're now finding uh, could be contributing to this peptide being low. It was a type of metabolic stress, a type of infectious stress, maybe some environmental stresses. I think that was the third S, but um, uh, some of these stresses can be avoided. And these are three main things that you can start doing right away or improving on right away that could help, um, especially in terms of prevention. The three S's are, the reason why I was uh, pointing out those other stresses is because the first S is stress. The second S is sleep. And the third S is social life. Stress, sleep, and social life. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about what social life means. We'll talk a bit about each one of these things. Stress, sleep, and social life. Okay, why is stress a factor at all? Uh, how could stress possibly affect the brain? Well, you may or may not know it, but chronic stress, so this is a type of stress that it's not just an incident that happens. This is like stress as a lifestyle. This is you being on, under chronic stress maybe for years and you live with a high level of stress. Did you know that chronic stress increases atrophy of a certain area in the brain? Meaning chronic stress increases the shrinking or the, the dying, really, of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the memory area in the brain. So that's how stress can be a contributing factor. And that stress, chronic stress over time can then affect that area in the brain. Wow, isn't that incredible? 
We're going to talk a little bit about stress as we go through this series over the course of the week, the next week. But I think that people sometimes see stress as a little bit um, maybe irritating, uh, but mostly innocuous, meaning not having you know an ill effect on anything. But stress has a very strong effect on our health, on our memory, and we see here it could be a contributing lifestyle factor to, uh, to dementia or Alzheimer's. The social aspect. Well, it's important to practice IDing social cues. IDing social cues. So this is one of the things that happens with dementia. People don't pick up as much on obvious social cues. So it's important to practice when you're talking with people or when you're when you're in a crowd, etc., to pay attention to small social cues, either verbal cues or body language, etc. So you keep that area in the brain processing. You keep that prefrontal cortex in the brain processing, thinking, and working. Uh, so very important to remain social um, as we're younger, but especially as we're getting older. And the final S was sleep. So we're just going to take a moment to talk about some things that can make sleep better. We have a full presentation on sleep, so it's just like a little taste, maybe a catnap um, when it comes to sleep. Things you can do that improve sleep. Number one, sleep in a fully dark room. Why? Because when you sleep in a fully dark room, an area in the brain, it's actually a gland in the brain called the pineal gland, is going to secrete a lot of a natural hormone that helps us to sleep, which is called melatonin. Melatonin is actually also a natural cancer preventative hormone, which we naturally secrete when we sleep. So sleep in a fully dark room so you get a really good natural dose of melatonin, and then you're going to sleep better, and it's also better for your health. Always go to sleep and wake up at the same time. So then your body's rhythm is set and different hormones and chemicals will be affected right, uh, will be secreted right on time. Do not drink liquids within four hours of bedtime. Why not? Well, you can probably guess. You drink some water, go to bed, and then within a few hours, you have to wake up and you have to go to the bathroom. And most people think this is not a big deal, but it actually disrupts your sleep cycle. I won't explain it now. You have to tune in to watch the presentation on sleep to find out what that means. Um, sleep in a clean room and turn the thermostat slightly down before bed. Clean room, just going with the principle of messy room, uh, active mind. So you don't want your brain to be seeing too many things and too active right before bed. Turn the thermostat slightly down before bed. The secretion of melatonin causes our body temperature to drop just a little bit. So if the room's too warm, then you're not going to be able to sleep as well. But I mean, as many of us know, if the room's too cold, it's difficult to sleep also. Exercise regularly, but not too soon before bed. Why? Because when you exercise too soon before bed, I have to admit I am guilty of doing this sometimes, then your cortisol level is high. Cortisol causes you to be alert and feel energetic and uh, you don't want to feel like that right before bed. The bedroom should only be used for two things, for sleeping and for intimacy, uh, because our brain really works well on, um, on hues and on routine. So if your bedroom is also your office and your bedroom is also your gym, then when it's time to go to bed, then your brain's going to kind of think, you know, okay, I'm ready to work out. No, okay, I'm ready to work. You know, so you want the brain to pick up that it's bedtime. No electronics or blue lights within one hour before bed. Why? Because the blue light, for example, the blue light from this little gadget, blue light from devices, actually causes the secretion of that sleep hormone that I mentioned, melatonin, which is also that natural cancer prevention hormone. It causes that hormone to be, like the secretion to be cut off. Why? The brain's ba basically interpreting this light to mean it's daytime. So it's daytime, you don't want to feel sleepy, so we don't want to release the sleep hormone. So do not use devices within an hour of bedtime. Avoid caffeine, avoid alcohol, avoid nicotine. They all interfere with sleep, 
Some people might say, well, I drink a little bit of alcohol like a nightcap and it helps me to go to sleep. But the interesting thing about alcohol is it helps with sleep onset. It will help you fall asleep, but then it causes disrupted sleep. So you don't actually get a high quality sleep. Um, alcohol also suppresses REM sleep. That's the time where memory consolidation happens. So it's associated with memory consolidation, with emotional well-being. This is part of the reason why when people wake up the next day, uh, maybe they might not remember as well, and they probably don't feel like they're in their best emotional well-being state. Uh, and of course, it increases snoring. Tip number nine, get outside for 30 minutes in the morning, why it helps you sleep at night. Going outside first thing in the morning and then looking at the sunlight, just letting that light hit the retina. Even if it's cloudy, even if you can't see the sun, which is probably the case uh, coming up and around uh, now at this time of year, but just letting the sunlight hit the retina causes a signal to be sent to the brain that starts the brain's natural pacemaker and that way cortisol levels, that alertness hormone that I talked about, they're kind of set for the day. So what you do first thing in the morning actually affects how well you sleep at night. Isn't that amazing? So get outside first thing in the morning and let your eyes kind of bathe in the natural light. And number 10, no napping. 30 minutes if it's absolutely needed. Uh, why? Because if you nap for longer than that, and most of us have already experienced this, then at night it makes it difficult to fall asleep. And to also establish a de-stressing and calming pre-bedtime routine. Uh, because your brain's going to pick up on this. Your pre-bedtime routine kind of works as a cue to the brain, saying it's time to relax and get ready for bed. So you do the same type of thing. Maybe you change the lighting, turn off the bright lights, put on a few lamps. Maybe you have a diffuser and you have some lavender going in the diffuser or something like that. Put on your pajamas, brush your teeth, etc. cetera. Um, and this way, your body and your brain are ready to go to sleep. So these are, I said we're focusing on three S's, the three S's of lifestyle, three lifestyle S's that can help with the prevention of Alzheimer's or dementia. So I said there was stress, there's sleep, and with stress and sleep, we actually have a presentation on stress, and we have a separate presentation on sleep as well. Uh, so you'll have to tune in for those, but stress and sleep are two of the three. We're gonna move on to, and the third one was social. What you can do socially, and basically that is, even when you're getting a little bit older, it's so important. I mean, we have a great kind of seniors program here, but so important to get out and to socialize, to be part of the community, et cetera. So you keep your brain active, and also so you're picking up on these cues, on these normal cues that, and a lot of them are nonverbal. So remaining social, very, very important. But we're gonna look at a few of the other things that studies have found are helpful. And one of them is mental stimulation. Science shows the importance of mental stimulation to maintain strong cognitive function. So now we're getting into things that you can practice and things you can implement, even starting, not necessarily tonight, because you don't want to, you know, your brain to be too active now, because hopefully you're winding down. But things you can start tomorrow. Mental stimulation. Games like over here, we have a picture of uh, some seniors who are playing um, dominoes or bingo or Sudoku or word games different types of things that are really working that logical thinking process in the brain, your prefrontal cortex, different uh, games that have to do with calculations, that have to do with logical thinking and analysis. So you want to continue to, to do some kind of game or activity that includes mental stimulation every single day. So there was a study done uh, a study on, um, just a study that had to do with different types of intervention to 
to try to promote independence in older adults, but also to look at the effects of doing certain things on cognitive decline. In this study, there were 2,832 participants, age 65 and over, and at entry into the trial, they did not have significant cognitive decline, physical de decline, or functional decline. They wanted to test the effect of three distinct cognitive interventions. So three different areas of um, lifestyle, kind of, that they were focusing on. Each with a targeted goal of improving memory, or improving reasoning, or improving the speed of information processing. So these three things where they had an intervention for reasoning training versus the control, an intervention for memory training, and an intervention for speed training. So these are the three areas that you want to focus on uh, to prevent cognitive decline or to even improve cognitive decline. These three areas are reasoning training, memory training, and speed training. So proximal outcomes, they focused on reasoning, memory, and attention processing speed. Primary outcomes, to see how quickly people could solve everyday problems, everyday problem solving. This is why being active is so important, because just in being active every day or being involved in a community or doing voluntary work or something where you're involved and you have to you have to figure out strategies and uh, ways of doing things, how to do things in an effective and efficacious way, how to work in a team. That type of thing is very, very important for that first intervention area, the reasoning training. So remain active, remain involved as you move into your senior years. Um, everyday problem solving. Next, with memory control, they were looking at the way that they could uh, help memory, especially in the activities, ADL stands for the activities of daily life and functioning. And then speed training, they were looking at using different types of intervention that helped with processing speed. Processing speed. And this could even be like uh, different interventions like what was on the slide that we just saw, Sudoku, uh, different types of games, etc. There's some different games on the computer that for memory and um, for brain training, these types of games, games that have to do with how quickly you can process things based on your level of attention. And they saw that this was affecting everyday speed. These things affected their driving habits. And in the end, the overall outcomes were they had a better quality of life in terms of health, higher mobility, and um, health service utilization was uh, more open to them. So the three areas that you want to focus on, and we'll talk a little more about things you can do for these areas. But reasoning training, reasoning training, so remain involved, maybe volunteer, uh, take part in a community, uh, get involved in projects. You have to be interacting with people and, have, and you need to you know, come up with deductions and do some problem solving. Memory training, so this might be things like the Sudoku game or the crossword or what's amazing is memorizing scripture or memorizing daily memory or memorization, and then speed training, how quickly you can pay attention to things and how quickly you can process things. And that could even include something like just reading, how quickly you process things that you're reading. Uh, there was another study done, it was a relation of cognitive activity to the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. This study's from 2007. They found more frequent participation in cognitive activity was associated with a reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease. More participation, more frequently, in cognitive activity. So this is like the Sudoku or the, what are those things called? The dominoes or the bingo or different things where you are kind of testing your brain. A cognitively inactive person, 
was 2.6 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than a cognitively active person. Isn't that incredible? Just that cognitive activity versus not being cognitively active. 2.6 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. So frequent cognitive activity was also associated with reduce, reduced incidence of mild cognitive impairment and less rapid decline in cognitive function. You know, for a while I was playing a game on, uh, on my phone with a friend of mine, uh, actually my friend's mom, who's in her 90s. And we were playing this game, it's, I wish I could remember the name of it. It's like a word game. It's a little bit like Scrabble. And you're playing, you're both on the phone at the same time and um, playing digital Scrabble. It was amazing. And I can't say that I always won. Like, she was really good at it. So games like that, I mean, it involves using your phone, but Scrabble is an incredible game, or you could play digital Scrabble on your phone. There are games like Moodle, um, which is a word game which is now available on your phone. So constantly playing games like that that challenge you. But Scrabble is a game that, that is just so intense and really, really uh, challenges your brain. So I, I would recommend Scrabble. Relation, uh, so again, for this study, the conclusion was this. And the name of the study was Relation of Cognitive Activity to the Risk of Developing Alzheimer's Disease, a study from 2007. Conclusion was the level of cognitively stimulating activity in old age is related to the risk of developing dementia. It's as clear as that. I'll repeat it. The level of cognitively stimulating activity in old age is related to the risk of developing dementia. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us it's so important to continue to be cognitively stimulated as we grow older. Don't slow down, maybe speed up instead. So what should I learn or practice? As I mentioned, I just mentioned a few games, the Sudoku, Bingo, um, Dominoes, some of the different word games, Scrabble, try new games. Other things that you can do, learn a new language. Learn a new language, and that's something that you'd have to practice every day. Next, anything to do with words, reading, writing, all of the word games that I'd mentioned, word puzzles. Um, instruments, fantastic for the brain. And hobbies, all of these things are different things that you can learn, different things that you can practice every single day and you want to do these things which challenge the brain. That's the goal. Now, if this kangaroo can learn to play the guitar, so can you. So, learning an instrument is something you'd have to practice every day, which is very stimulating for the brain. So, what should I learn or practice? I would mentioned when we looked at that study that looked at these three areas, one of them was rational thought, and the other one was memory, and the other one was uh, speed of, of assessment. Um, the third, second one was memory, and the thing that, that you could do for memory was memorization. So what should I learn or practice? Practice memorization. Memorization. You can memorize rhymes, you can memorize patterns. You can memorize you know, the capitals of states or the capitals of provinces, the capitals of countries. Learn new things. If you're going somewhere, don't always use the same route. Use a new route when you're going somewhere so that you're not just, so that you're, you're being a little more stimulated. And you know, there's something that we can memorize, which is just so amazing because when we memorize it, it continues to feed us spiritually and mentally throughout the day and uh, throughout the next day and sometimes the week or the year, and that's the Bible. So memorizing scripture is so fantastic. I mean, according to these studies, memorization helps with uh, prevention of cognitive decline or at least decreasing the risk. So why not memorize scripture and get that spiritual nourishment as well? So fantastic, you know, option for memorization. 
There was something else that I found. It was a recommendation uh, as I was reading about cognitive decline, and it was, it was basically saying, become curious like a child once again. Maybe don't behave like a child, but get curious like a child once again. Don't just suddenly pick this trait up. You want to cultivate curiosity. I know it sounds funny, but you're practicing curiosity. Cultivate curiosity. So cultivate curiosity when you're younger and then build it into your personality. But if you're not younger anymore, cultivate curiosity right now. Start practicing. Be inquisitive. Ask questions. You know, even think of things when you're just on your own, things you want to look into the next day, maybe things you want to look up on the internet or books that you want to read or you're curious about you know, learning about things in different places in the world, etc. Get curious uh, because this is really going to activate the brain. And once you start getting curious about something, it's like, it's like the domino effect. You start thinking about something, which leads you to think about something else, think about something else, and it just goes down in a cascade. So get curious. Also, as I said, what else can you do? Read and write. You want to work with words. Reading and writing and, of course, memorizing. And sometimes people get tired of reading or maybe they, they don't find the material to be very good or maybe it's, they have to wear glasses, etc. I mean, kind of like the picture that we have here. Put your glasses on, start reading, start writing. And as I said, one of the most wonderful things to memorize is this beautiful book right here, which is the Bible. So memorizing the Bible, reading the Bible, writing about what you've read, uh, actually journaling can be very, very effective. And it's also a really good practice to start right away so that you're using your cognitive ability. You can read something in scripture. You could memorize scripture. You can write down your Bible verse. And then you can write down what you feel you're learning from that Bible verse. What is it saying to you? Or what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? So read, memorize, and write. Use the Bible as a tool to read, to memorize, and to write, and also to be fed spiritually. Amen? So is lifestyle a contributing factor? Lifestyle meaning how we treat our body, what we eat, uh, etc. It's Alzheimer's is often called type 3 diabetes. So yes, lifestyle is definitely a contributing factor and what you eat can be a contributing factor. So I want to talk about prevention and what can help. Type 3 diabetes. Um, a variant of the so-called Alzheimer's gene, which is uh, the APOE4 gene, seems to interfere with brain cells' ability to use insulin. This is why Alzheimer's is called type, being called now type 3 diabetes, which may eventually cause the cells to starve and die. Unofficially, it's called type 3 diabetes. What it refers to is that their brains, the brains of people with Alzheimer's, uh, their brain's insulin utilization or signaling for the utilization of insulin is not functioning. Uh, they've done many studies, whoops, whoops. They've done many studies actually on different diets in Alzheimer's. And in several of these studies, at least studies that I read about, they were working with the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet and in Alzheimer's patients. And they found that when they hit this certain point in ketosis, it seemed like the brain kind of picked up and began to function better and people became very lucid and very clear. But once they changed the diet, then they did not kind of hold those effects or those results. So if you're curious, you can do, uh, don't just fully take it uh, from me here, but do a little bit of research on Alzheimer's and the ketogenic diet. Researchers have known for several years that being overweight and having type 2 diabetes can increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So there we have two things that could 
decrease the risk. Number one, if you are overweight, then losing weight, bringing your weight back into a healthy BMI, which is between 18 to 25. And the second thing, if you have type 2 diabetes, make sure that it's controlled or begin working on that and start changing your diet, et cetera, because those two things, being overweight and having type 2 diabetes, can increase the risk, risk of developing Alzheimer's. Okay, so we've just talked a little bit about diet and lifestyle. And you might say, come on, what I eat doesn't make a difference. So does lifestyle make a difference? Yes, yes, it does. What you eat can make a difference. High carb diet is actually linked to early Alzheimer's. A high carbohydrate intake could be bad for you because carbohydrates impact your glucose and impact your insulin metabolism. Sugar basically fuels the brain. So a moderate intake of sugar is good. However, high levels of sugar may actually prevent the brain from using the sugar, similar to what we see in type 2 diabetes. Not everyone with MCI goes on, which is a mild cognitive impairment, goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease, but many people do says the lead author, Rosebud Roberts, who is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Min, Min. So high carb intake, that's something that we can all modify right away, which is bringing down the amount or level of carbohydrates in our diet. What else can make a difference? Smoking. It's dose dependent. Uh, in studies that were done on smoking, there was an increased risk from baseline by 79%. If you were a smoker who also was a heavy drinker for several years, then Alzheimer's disease tended, tends to start six to seven years earlier. So a combination of smoking and drinking. So this is answering the question, does lifestyle make a difference? Yes, it does. The high carb diet, smoking and drinking. Smoking cessation though can reverse circulation damages. So if you are doing these things, if you have a high carb diet, if you're smoking and drinking, and also if you're overweight, those four things, high carb diet, smoking, drinking, overweight, you know where to focus on so that your risk of Alzheimer's or your risk of dementia will decrease. Okay, food. Uh, what type of diet should we be thinking of? The Mediterranean diet is the best dietary pattern for reducing cognitive decline. The Mediterranean diet is very high in fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and it also has a lot of olive oil in it, and fish like salmon. Fruit and vegetable consumption in one study, they found that those who ate the most fruit reduce the risk of uh, cognitive decline by 36%. And those who ate the least amount of fruit increased the risk by 73%. So something easy to do, increase your fruits and vegetable intake. And I love the dark berries and the sour fruits. I know they're not as popular, but they're a little lower in fructose. So these types of things, chips, um, you might say, well, this is my food. These are my favorite comfort foods. Chips, Nutella, processed foods, etc. The first step really here would be to remove labeled foods. To, so to remove processed foods, foods that have a label. And then increase no label foods like uh, apples and spinach. There's no label on apples except the price tag and spinach, price, etc. There's not a long ingredient list. So we want to go with the natural foods that, um, that have no labels and remove the processed foods as well as bring down our carbohydrate intake. And if you're overweight or smoke or drink, then you want to make changes in those three areas. Um, and th those are maybe not easy, but I might say simple 
lifestyle changes that can lead to decreasing your risk of cognitive decline. If you have a problem with your lifestyle now, I'm saying it will only get bigger and multiply, the way that rabbits multiply. There's no time to make changes like right now. Don't even wait for a month or two or Monday. Start now. Food. What can you add to your diet? Omega-3 is uh, helpful, very good for brain health. Olive oil is protective. Peanut oil is not protective. So if you have peanut oil at home, swap it out for olive oil, preferably organic, cold-pressed, virgin olive oil. Uh, with omega-6, ome lots of omega-6s, six oils are found in processed food. And so in general, North Americans eat a lot of omega-6 fatty acids and they don't realize it because it's in the processed foods that we're eating. So you don't need generally more omega-6. You maybe need more omega-3 or more olive oil. With omega-6, there's a higher risk for dementia. Um, if you are not then eating a lot of omega-3s to offset it. So omega-3s are found in things like flax, flaxseed oil, walnuts, salmon, uh, those really oily fish as well. What else could you add into your diet? Concord grape juice, one of my favorites, so delicious. Uh, they found in studies that supplementation improved memory function for elderly, uh, elderly people with mild cognitive impairment. So you might just include maybe one glass of 100% pure, so read the labels. Uh, better to get it from someone who actually supplies the juice. 100% pure organic Concord grape juice, a glass of that every morning. What else? Blueberries. They found in studies that supplementation, whoops, supplementation, oh, I've done it again. I better speak quickly. Supplementation with blueberries improved memory. So about a cup of blueberries every day after your grape juice can be very effective as well. Blueberries are very strong antioxidants and they tend to, um, antioxidants then nullify or reduce free radicals. What else? Exercise, exercise. What type of exercise? So aerobic exercise may reduce Alzheimer's by 50%. That is aerobic exercise. You're doing it for 30 minutes five times a week, aerobic exercise. 30 minutes, five times a week. So this might just be walking. It might be speed walking for 30 minutes, five times a week. What else? Strength training. Strength training, and this is for people who are over the age of 65, two to three times per week, may cut your risk by another 50%. So optimally, if you did the 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, and then you added, when you're ready, some strength training onto that, that is the ultimate workout. The aerobic exercise for 30 minutes, and then maybe 15 to 20 minutes of strength training. This is a total of about 45 to 50 minutes of exercise. And that way, you're really reducing your risk as much as possible. Okay, other things that have, these are not things that I'm actually recommending as a naturopathic doctor, but just giving you some information on studies on different herbs, uh, as well as the food and exercise, etc. So they've done studies on an herb called saffron, and they found that it's similar to a very common pharmaceutical that's given for Alzheimer's called donopezil. Uh, this was a long study for 22 weeks, and what they found in this study was, as soon as this butterfly does his full job, uh, what they found in this study, and this is what saffron did, as uh, saffron um, looks like, they found that after 22 weeks, they were getting similar results with saffron to the results that they get with donopezil. Isn't that amazing? Similar results with saffron to a pharmaceutical drug that's used for Alzheimer's disease. And that's after a very long study. What else? With sage leaf, they found that sage leaf could actually uh, result in better cognitive function. 
Uh, this was a four-month study that I found, and the sage leaf was given in a liquid form. Often when botanicals are used in a liquid form, it means that they're very concentrated, so that's like a high dosing, uh, using sage leaf for four months. What else? Lemon balm. Again, this was a four-month study, and the participants in the study were given liquid drops of lemon balm. Lemon balm is actually a very common botanical medicine, and it's very commonly used in a tincture form as well. Tincture form is like a liquid form. And in this study, uh, for four months, they took liquid lemon balm drops daily, and after four months, the result was better cognitive function. Amazing. Just as we're wrapping up now, I would be remiss if I did not address stress and use biblical passages to talk about stress. But as I said, stress is one of the presentations that we're going to be, uh, that we will be uh, looking at and seeing throughout the course of this health series. So within the next seven days, we'll look more into stress and we'll look more into sleep. Two of those three things that could affect um, cognitive decline or dementia. So the Bible tells us this in Philippians chapter four, verse six. So if we are feeling stressed, and I said this, I'm saying this because one of the factors that we already mentioned was chronic stress. And why chronic stress, why, what does chronic stress have to do with cognitive decline? Chronic stress, as I said, can cause the atrophy or the shrinkage of the area in the brain that's responsible for memory. So chronic stress can cause shrinking of the brain's hippocampus. Wow. So the answer to chronic stress is in the Bible. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and you can use this to apply when you're feeling stressed. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and by supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests, let your stresses be made known to God. And God offers us this beautiful exchange. We give him those requests, we give him that stress, and in exchange, he gives us something else. He gives us peace. And that's the answer for stress, isn't it? Peace. It says that when you let your requests be made known to God, the peace of God will guard your hearts and guard what? Your mind. And when that peace is guarding your mind, stress levels go down. Interestingly, though, before we go to the next Bible verse, this is like a step-by-step -step kind of formula here. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, number one, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So you're praying uh, and you're saying thanks to God, and then you're letting your request be made known, and then God answers by giving you peace, not just in your heart, but peace in your mind. So try those steps. Try praying in a different way if you don't already. You're praying and you're thankful. And then after you're filled with thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord, then you let your requests, let your stresses, etc., be made known. And you will find that God will give you an incredible peace, not just in your heart, but peace in your mind. And that's what brings down stress. And when stress is lower, then risk for atrophy of the hippocampus, the area in the brain for memory, that risk goes down. I also want to end with this Bible verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way that you think. So usually when we think of cognitive decline and we think of Alzheimer's or we think of dementia, we're thinking about thinking. So don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Maybe behaviors and customs like eating a lot of carbohydrates or behaviors and customs like smoking and like drinking or customs that lead to obesity, all factors for cognitive decline. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And when he changes the way you think, 
it will make it easier to make these lifestyle changes that we've mentioned here. Finally, as we're coming to the conclusion of our talk today, I just want to encourage you, especially if you're thinking of making some of the lifestyle changes that we've mentioned today, you are on a new road. It's step by step, and uh, I just want to encourage you as you begin to take these steps and make these lifestyle changes. Um, so we're going to end with a prayer, and, uh, and then we'll end here. Let us pray. Lord, you are just so good. Your goodness runs after us and chases us, Lord. I just want to pray and ask God that the presentation uh, would be helpful to everyone who listens to it, Lord. Uh, I pray and ask about the lifestyle changes. If there are people who are watching and hearing this presentation um, that, that need to make these lifestyle changes, to eat differently, to uh, stop smoking, stop drinking alcohol, to lose weight so they're in, within a healthier weight, Lord, uh, to become more active physically and to become more active mentally, to become more involved socially and to sleep better and bring stress down, Lord. I pray that you'll help us, help all of us to make those changes, Lord. And Jesus, please touch our brains, touch our minds so that we can have better cognitive function. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a good night, everyone.